Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Luer, and I'm excited to have a good friend on the line here, Mr. Reiner Schüttler, calling in from Zurich, but originally, of course, from Germany. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Marcus. Thanks for having me. No, great. I'm looking forward to our conversation here. Um, you're actually the first uh, professional athlete I'm interviewing on my podcast, uh, and uh, and I think you're perfect because not just where you you were obviously had a very illustrious and successful career in tennis, um, but you are now an entrepreneur. So uh, I think we're going to have a fun conversation about number one, of course, your amazing career, but second, of course, how you take some of that learning from uh, being a pro. Uh, and the ups and downs which a career, of course, has, and your current career spans 17 years, so that's a, obviously a very long career uh, and very successful career, um, and how that all ended up being, uh, you know, what you're doing now. So, um, so you are actually one of the few people who does not have a LinkedIn profile, which I normally use to uh, to talk about. You have a Wikipedia page full of some great information on yourself, and so uh, that was really helpful. Um, so rather than uh, you know starting off how someone started a, uh, a, a their normal uh, let's say traditional career, talk, to, talk tell us how you got into the world of tennis. You know who was your idol when you started, and, and you know when did you realize that you were good enough to make money with this? Um, you know, actually, I, I think uh, I got a tennis profession by a little bit by mistake, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because my my first I played soccer when I was uh, I started soccer. I think the second I, I was uh, I was r walking or running, right. and then when I was at the age of ten, I actually my father was playing tennis, so he took me to the. Uh, to the tennis courts, mm -hmm. and that's the first time I was actually holding a tennis racket. So for um, for a tennis professional, actually very late. Right. And uh, my my passion before was was really playing playing uh, football. football. I mean, I was every day. Yeah, I was every day um, on the on the football field with friends, and. Uh, then actually in within one week uh, we always shared with friends we shared cars uh, to go to the practice to the football practice and then in within one week they forgot twice to pick me up and i was really upset about this and that's <laughs> actually when i started to play to play more tennis because there i knew hey i don't really have to wait for anybody i just can go on the court with a friend and play and and not uh, you have to think if somebody picks me up or not and that was a starting point wow that's a unique one. And it's funny because actually that's the same time when I started to play tennis, ten, when I was about 10. Uh, never quite made it to your levels, of course. But uh, yeah, that was, um, I have very fond memories. Uh, the first sort of, from 10 to about 20, tennis was my life. Uh, this was sort of the Boris Becker era, right? As you can imagine, the, the whole of Germany was there. Yes. So how much was Boris an influence for you as well? I mean, he was, he's obviously a couple of years ahead of you. Yeah, I mean, of course, he was a was a big influence. I mean, I had him uh, in in life size as a poster on my kids' room door, and of course, I saw all his matches, and I was following him. And he was in in Germany at this time the the biggest hero. I mean, tennis wise, from the from the way somebody plays, my idol is, is Andre Agassi because okay. I think his game style. Of course, he's um, he achieved much, much, much more than me, and I, I don't even want to think about comparing myself with him. But from the game style, he's standing close to the line, um, uh, yeah, playing aggressive, good returns, moving well, and and um, I think my game style was more more like Agassi than Becker. So that's why my idol, of course, was Boris because he's German. The 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 um, yeah, he won Wimbledon with at the age of 17 and. Um, Incredible what he achieved. Absolutely. So how did it, I mean, talk us just a bit through um, how do you get from, you know, ha taking the first record in your hand at the age of 10 to turning pro at whatever age that was, um, you know, how do you get there? Just, a, you know, sort of a sort of nice short uh, intro of how, uh, how, how a tennis career, you know, unfolds. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I started the first time playing tennis at the age of 10. And then for the first one or two years, nothing really happened. I mean, I played once a week, a group of four kids, you know, with a coach. And and then, um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And, and also my father was, uh, he was playing tennis. So I started to get more and more on the court, always uh, pushing him to play with me. Mm. And uh, then playing more, uh, playing also in, in a junior team, then playing with my teammates more. Really? And uh, really at, at the age of 12, 13, I started to play every single day because mm. I liked it so much. And um, then I started to play like the regional championships, then the state championships. 
Mm. And amazing, uh, I was really surprised, but I, I did well. So I, 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 I didn't expect it, but I, I was playing pretty successful. And then I, I was um, the first time I met my coach, which I, at the, then at the later I was working for 20 years, uh, Dirk Hordov, was when at the age of 14, between 14 and 15. So I, mm -hmm. I came pretty far in the in the state championships. Mm -hmm. And so he was asking me about uh, what I what I want look uh, or what I want from tennis, if I can imagine to play a little bit more serious and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't sure at that point, honestly, because I was home, I, I went to school, I had my friends, I had my, my family, and I didn't really think that this could be professional. I also grew up in a, in a relatively small town, um, so with 20,000 people, and actually not in the city, in the little village with 700 people. So for me, wow. it was not really, I didn't live like uh, in Frankfurt or, or, or big city where yeah. the infrastructure is much easier. So for me, it was always more difficult with driving uh, to tournaments, driving to practice. So I was really relying on my on my parents. And, and uh, I really have to, to say that they, I mean, they never needed to push me because I wanted to play, and it, I, I have to thank them so much that they really drove me everywhere in the, in the entire country. And I don't know how many days or months or years of their life they spent with me in the car and on tournaments, but yeah. without them, it for sure wouldn't have been possible to to even start. Yeah. And then, um, and and then when it got more serious was when when I was 16. I, again, I played successful in the in the state championships. And then um, I started to talk to Dirk more and he gave me like practice schedules and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And um, that's actually when it started to, to get more serious when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And um, he also asked me if I, if I would play the junior uh, world, champion, uh, world ranking tournaments, ITF junior tournaments. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, for me, it was exciting. I mean, I, I had the chance to get out of school for one to three weeks, like uh, yeah. not being in school, playing tennis, what I love to do. So that's actually how, how it started. Right. And, um, and yeah, and for me, it was exciting to, to travel the world. I mean, my first tournaments were in, uh, were in um, Thailand, then in China and in Hong Kong, the junior mm -hmm. tournaments. And then mm -hmm. I went at the end of the year when I was 16 to Sweden. So, in, and I made already some points. So after one year, I was already, uh, my best ranking was number 13 in the junior world ranking. Mm -hmm. And I, I was still going to school. You know, of course, yeah. I, it was not easy with school because half of the of the teachers there were a little bit divided because they thought, okay, you cannot miss so much of school because you're playing tennis. And of course, nobody thought that at some point I, I, this would be my profession. Yeah. And half of the, half of the teachers they really liked it and they really supported me in this. So mm. um, this was not so easy. I remember when my mother came back once from uh, when the parents meet and they talk to the teachers and she was really upset because uh, some teachers told her listen it's not possible that your son is missing school because playing tennis i mean it's just his hobby right. you know and she knew how much it meant to me and uh, she was like really upset because like how can you take something away from uh, from a junior who really loves what he's doing and it brings yeah. him so much like and he's good traveling at the world and, right. and he's good at it, meeting other people. So, but the other half was very supportive, and they they really helped me also to, you know, to to learn what I've missed. And uh, I remember I had some um, with Mr. Rausch. He was also luckily he was in in the in the board of the tennis club I was playing, and he always like told me, hey, you have to do this, you have to this material. I have it for you. You have to study. Went for the next test. So he was really pushing me, helping me, and that uh, that was great. Amazing. Yeah. And, and so then, when so what was the sort of age yeah. when you when you sort of realized okay I'm gonna take this series now and, and I'm going to the next level? I I would say when I when maybe when I was 17 when I say hey I'm I'm pretty good in the junior world ranking then uh, Dirk um, he was telling me listen after after school you should try two more year uh, two years to play tennis if you're successful you continue if not you uh, you you go to study you know it, it was um, and he was really taking the pressure also uh, off me a little bit because he has, you have nothing to lose just mm -hmm. try it if you love it try it right. and he was working at this time already with Alexander Radulescu who was also in the quarterfinals Wimbledon lost to Molly by Washington he was top 50 in the world mm. um and um 
and and so he has really he had already good experience and uh, how to make a junior into a professional tennis player how to make the transformation and then after i graduated from school when i was 19 so i remember i was writing my last test in school and uh, i wanted to party of course the weekend with my friends and they entered the tournament for me and he says, no, you do your test, you have one hour to be with your friends, then you get in the car, and then you play a tournament this week. And I said, I'm crazy. And my, all my, my friends and, and classmates said, he's crazy. Why is he playing a tournament? He should party. Right. And But I, I got in the car and I played the tournament. Right. <laughs> and that's when everything started. Yeah, that's awesome. So when, when was that, what was the age you sort of appeared the first time on the, on the ATP Tour ranking? What, what age were you at that time? Um, th this was 18 because when I uh, I went when I I think it was 18 or 19 because when I went to school I played in my, in my um, in my holidays in the autumn holidays I played as, at this time it was not a future it was a satellite so you play three tournaments and if you um, if you are under I think the, under the best 32 players. Uh, then you go into the masters, which is different now. Now your futures you can make on every tournament points, but before it was a little different structure. So I played it in in Turkey. I already um, made 11 points, which brought me at this time to the ranking around 700, 720 maybe. And then I didn't play anything for one year. And the next year I played the same tournament. I made the second place. So uh, already. And uh, mm. I went to, I don't know, 500, 400. So it was actually during school I started. Got it. And I remember I didn't, I didn't play uh, my last year as a junior at the US Open in New York because it was the same time when the satellite was taking place in Turkey. And I said, okay, I need to make a transformation. I don't have so much time as, as if I would be professional already. Mm. So I had to pick and choose and I decided to, uh, to make the transformation to the men's tennis already then and didn't play the US Open. Right. So this was a time when, when I got my first points. Interesting. And, and again, I mean, obviously, it's not necessarily inexpensive to fly around the world and just play tennis. So it was all your family supporting it or you had already some sponsors or, or funding from somewhere else? Of course, my, my family was supporting me as much as they could. But also Dirk, who was also who was my coach and my manager for 20 years, mm -hmm. he he did it. He did already there. He he did a great job, and I had like already uh, already record sponsor, clothing sponsor. I had one, uh, Mr. Jaros Kocha Ulma, a private uh, sponsor who who helped me from the age when I was 16 already. And uh, it's great. We are still in touch every year before Christmas. We still have dinner. You know, we stay in touch, and it's really nice. Uh, nice to have these long-lasting relationships, which for me are, are yeah, that's the best that can happen. You know, when you when somebody supports you, but you always have a, a great personal connection. Hmm. Absolutely. And, and and so I had um, I had sponsors. I had help from from Dirk, who was really trying everything to make the cost as little as possible. And uh, he also he also told me, listen, in case something goes wrong uh, financially, you know, I'm always I, I will be there for the for the two years to back back you if something if, if you don't make enough money in case. Uh, and he said, I believe that we will have enough money, but in the worst case, I back you up. And this is also something where you think as a 16 year old, wow, or 17 year old, wow, that's crazy that somebody believes so much in you right. that you can actually uh, being successful. Which at this point, I di really didn't believe. Uh, my plan was already to uh, I my sister is working in a bank I wanted to work in a bank you know my my <laughs> life my life actually was planned in a different way but of course I'm very very lucky that it went this way well you definitely lived my dream you know that was sort of the dream I had but uh, clearly I realized I wasn't anywhere near good enough um, to do this uh, now let's fast forward a little bit here and, and I just want to throw out a few numbers here from your career highlight um, and then we'll go into this so your career highest ranking was number five in the world in 2004. Um, you made the U.S. Uh, sorry, the Australian Open final uh, in 2003. Um, you were Wimbledon semifinalist in 2008, so quite a bit of gap there. Um, you won in total four tournaments, both in men's singles and doubles, um, and you made, according to the numbers I saw, somewhere around 7.5 million U.S. dollars in prize money, not I guess including uh, endorsements and other things. So clearly, uh, what what your coach saw, um, and and uh, you know, compared to a banking career, you did very well there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 
I, I had a good I had a good career when you look at the when you look at the numbers and the and the tournaments. Yeah, I agree, and I'm really happy that I, I chose this over any other career. I can imagine. So so let's talk a bit about it here uh, for a bit. You know the, the ups and downs because clearly, um, as I said, you know I think your career record is sort of about even, right? I think you just about lost as many as you won. So uh, you know it, it's truly a very balanced um, uh, career a win and, and loss record here. Uh, you know, how do you, you know, what do you learn from losing and what do you learn from winning, you know, as, as an athlete? And then we'll relate it a bit to, you know, how that obviously works in the world of business. Yeah, that's, that's, a, um, that's not easy, I have to admit, because when you see I played uh, so many years and I just won four tournaments and singles, four and doubles. Okay, I played also some, uh, I think I played 12 finals or something like this. So, mm. but my career was when you just look at the numbers and i think you always have to look at the big picture that's also what in the beginning uh, dirk told me um don't look at it now look where you want to be in half a year or a year so when you see right. i for example i i in 11 years in a row i improved my ranking so i was always a very consistent worker mm -hmm. i uh, i think till 2004 uh, or 2004 was my highest ranking and then I dropped at the end of the year um, but till then I always improved my ranking which right. was uh, which was incredible so I had from from 95 when I started pro till 2004 mm -hmm. I, I always at the end of the year I increased my ranking and uh, but yes it is is challenging because now I look at it a little bit in a different way than mm. when I was a player because when you lose and you lose pretty much every week. Yep. <laughs> so even if you win two, three matches, one yep. match you most likely lose, Correct. except if you're Roger, Rafa, Novak. Yeah. But uh, but they for sure have a, have a different record. But if you're an average player or a good player, <laughs> then you have a lot of losses also. Right. And um, for me, it was always difficult um, to deal with this and I was always like a kind of perfectionist so I always wanted to wanted to win and if I lose I always was looking um, for the mistake by myself not that the other player maybe was better had a better day mm -hmm. was uh, I didn't like to play him how he technically played or tactically played so and and uh, now, as a, because now I'm also I coach some players, and I have a little bit more distance. I'm not emotionally so involved. I see mm. it more in a rational way, and and trying to improve the player. Right. Um, but when you're a player, you're so invested. I mean, you you go to bed. It, it depends when you have practice. You eat and you drink the night before a match, like that. You're hydrated. You everything. It from waking up to when you practice, when you take a massage, when you do fitness. When when you take a day rest, everything is so structured right. that you really that you're so invested that you that I while I was playing I took it uh, very personal and emotional that I lost, right. which now I would never do. I would look more at the big picture. Maybe at this point it also pushed me to work hard, to work consistent, to always try to get better and better. But um, now when I look back, it would have been great to take to take even a loss, like to analyze and, and take it not as hard to say, hey, tomorrow I go on court, I try to improve this and to see it a little bit more with distance and not so much emotions. Right. Yeah, no, and um, I think in hindsight is always good <laughs> in all sort of things. Right? I, 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 all the things you're talking about, I, my, my little tennis career just flashes in front of my eyes there, me throwing records around and stuff, and, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking, what was I doing, right? But, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, it is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting because it, I think in business is no different, right? At the end of the day, uh, you, in, you're not going to win all the time in business either, so that's why I, I do believe there's some very interesting learning from how an athlete looks looks at it and learns from it and, and like you said you, you're at the end of the day you lose probably as much as you win you know unless you I guess a few of the top 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 guys there um, now I, I want to go a little bit into the sort of uh, um, side of it of when was the time when you started to realize that okay 
this aim, of course, I'm making some good money now, but there is, of course, something I have to be doing after. I won't be playing tennis forever. Um, and when you sort of start to going away from just being there on the court 24 hours um, and, and or, or you know, all day long is just focused on the next match to sort of thinking, hey, you know what? I'm a businessman, right? I, I need to make connections. I, I need to use the, the opportunities I have that I'm famous, that I'm in, on television. Uh, when did that sort of start to come in? Which sort of what part of the career? Um, you know, that, that actually came pretty early for me because um, uh, Dirk, his, he had uh, two real estate companies. So when I stopped playing, uh, when I, I started playing tennis, when I, I finished my school, the first thing he did, we had uh, in, in Bad Homburg, which is a city close to Frankfurt. That's mm -hmm. where, I, where I moved, where I practiced. The, the regional federation center in Offenbach was, uh, was close by. So I really had the good facilities to practice. Mm -hmm. And he straight away... He said, hey, now um, you you start playing tennis, but you also have to, you, you don't know if you get injured, if you play well, if you don't play well, how long you play. So always keep your eyes open. And, and he had the two real estate companies mm -hmm. and he was taking me, for example, uh, every second day, I had to learn with 10 fingers how to, uh, how to ride so um, mm -hmm. with it on the keypad, you know, yes. type recorder, yeah. So, so he started right away. Then he took me to meetings uh, when he had to go to real estate meetings, like um, uh, when I was here not playing tournaments. So he tried to push me um, in, in different directions already to see, hey, what can you do later? Don't waste your time because actually you have a lot of time in between if you want to. Yeah. And also while I was then playing on tour, while I was playing better, he was uh, he was pushing me a little bit in the direction hey go to to join the players council then I, I actually at some point i was president of the players council of the atp so mm. always to to learn something to to move forward to look behind the scenes and i think that was very important for me yeah no uh, yeah it definitely sounds like it i you might know i, I interviewed david falk who obviously was michael jordan's agent right and and, uh, and part mm. of that conversation was wasn't just how great jordan was which is an obvious um, but how much um, he and David, play, you know, really worked on the, the commercial side or, or business in general uh, and how astute Michael was and picking all these things up from, from his coach or from his manager at that time, which sounds similar to, to your manager, right? Um, so I think it's important, I guess, uh, um, how, the, you know, what sort of a mentor you have in your early career, right? Yes, that, that's for sure. And, and there I I really have to say that he, he always tried to, you know, to to um, keep my interest or to to make my my mind open for new things to to see and and he also told me hey the more things you see the more later you know what interests you and what you really want to do and mm. till today i mean i i always said also i said while i was playing tennis after my career i want to do real estate because i i learned some of the things uh, while starting to play tennis, going with him to meetings, you know, and, and always ask him, hey, what about this? Why is this project good? Why this not? So so it always interests me. Definitely. Now, uh, just to come back a little bit more, one more time into the, t into your career. Um, I do know, I've, I've read about, there was a very tough loss you had um, at the Olympics where you, you guys won the silver medals for Germany in the 2004 Olympics. Uh, with Nicholas Kiefer, but uh, I think you guys had a couple of match points, and then you still lost it, right? So, um, was that would that be considered one of your hardest losses um, in your career, or which one would you pick? I mean, this one was a really tough one. <laughs> I, I have to admit. Um, of course, another tough one is when you when you lose in the finals of a Grand Slam. I mean, uh, yes. I got uh, pretty much uh, pretty much killed uh, from from Andrew Agassi in the finals of Australian Open. Luckily, I beat him the same year in. Um, in Canada in the quarterfinals, you know, so I, I got uh, at least a little yeah, revenge, back. but of yeah. course, it, it, yeah, but it is of course no, um, comparison. yeah, no comparison to lose, yeah, to lose in the Grand Slam finals, and really yeah. I, I had no chance. He beat me, I think six two six two six one, like I was far away from having a chance, and that's for sure a tough loss. But uh, when you play Olympics, uh, I played together with with Kiwi and. You, you can see it in two different ways. I mean, one way is, yes, it was for sure. I was never so sad after a loss um, than after this match. I remember when we when we lost, we had four match points. 
um, we were sitting, I think, for two hours on our balcony in the in the Olympic Village. Um, we were sitting there. We didn't talk. I mean, the, it was just dead silent, and mm. we were completely empty. I mean, I know we now there was um, uh, there was a 15 years anniversary of, of the Olympics, and uh, he sends me a message message, and he says, "Today, I really think about you a lot." You know, mm. so it, it's still after so many years, you still connected and it still hurts but on the other on the other side uh, i had a i the next day i was flying home i didn't want to stay there so i, I was flying home because also for us tennis players uh, we go then uh, to to the to the states to play the us open you know sure. so we don't have so much time yeah. and some athletes they really work for it for four years and then they they stay there till the uh, um, f final ceremony and everything. Mm. So the tennis players most of the time they don't do it. So I remember I was flying the next morning. I was taking the first flight I home. I I wanted to see my parents because I was so sad. Mm. And um, and then I I came home, like uh, my mom asked me, hey, should we invite somebody? I said, please, just family. I'm really destroyed. Like let's not uh, do anything. I, I anyways I have one one day then I have to go to the states. So let's just the family be together. That's it. So mm. then I came home, and within one hour my my father asked me three times, Hey, should we not at least invite uh, your aunt and uncle? They they were watching with us together. You know it was here big hype. Um, it should be no and after the third time I said do whatever you want. So he called my aunt and uncle, and within one hour. Um, the entire house, the garden, every everything was full. There was an um, orchestra from the little village coming, <laughs> playing music with trumpets, with everything. So it was crazy. And then mm -hmm. I realized how much it actually means for them. You know, mm -hmm. I'm crazy sad, and everybody just yeah. wanted to see the medal and was celebrating. So then it, it, it got actually a different turn also for me. And when you now see it with distance, I mean, we every doubles we played – we were the underdogs. I mean, mm. we were not the favorites to win, and we beat incredible teams. Mm. And okay, we lost in the finals, had four match points. Yes, was a tough loss, but probably also was one of the best experiences in my life. Yeah, absolutely. And that medal is always going to be there. And and I and that's I think that's the beautiful part of sports, as well as of course of a career of an athlete. You know, the, you have these amazing moments. Um, do you miss them? You know, I mean, when you look back, uh, you, you miss your playing days, or are you sort of, you know, happy to, to that you moved on now? Mm, now I miss it when when I see it, and I I said, ah, I, I would be great to be a little bit younger, you know, to to be on tour again. But I played very long. I mean, I stopped when I right before I turned 36, and at this mm. time now everybody's playing a little bit longer. Um, players are more fit they take much more care of the body so um so now everybody plays longer but at this time when i stopped like it's when you see michael sich boys becker yeah yeah they stopped when they were 29 30 yeah. there was a maximum you played right. so and and um so for me at the time when i stopped i was actually I didn't miss it one day for, I don't know, four or five years because I played really long and yeah. I was, I was tired and I was happy and I, I and I felt also that, um, that the young players coming up, that they are much fitter. I, I mean, I'm not so tall. I'm one, one meter 80. And, um, so now the guys, they are 190, 195. So, yeah. so they are, they are different, different athletes than, yeah. Yeah, than before. Absolutely. Yeah, no, really interesting. Um, now, what 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 is the sort of if we now move a bit into the sort of uh, second half of your career, right? Now you are um, you know an established entrepreneur. Um, you have your own tournament. Um, what would what would be the biggest learnings? If you just look at everything you've learned um, as a pro. Um, which you've now taken on is it the work assets is it you know knowing you know how to just whatever focus on things to to get to the best point or what what is it really what, what you see is is sort of the transition for you there for for me for sure what helps me a lot is um when as a, as a player you also lose a lot you know you get disappointed disappointed and um you yeah, you have have to move on. You next day you go on the court and you practice, yeah, and it's the same here. Match coming, yeah. um, 
yeah, it's the same in business. And and as what I had, I have to admit, what I had problems or what I was not used to, like when you play tennis and you play quite okay, normally people want something from you. But then when you go into the business world, you want something from people, especially when you have a when you have a tournament. Like you look for sponsors. You you want to make this deal happen. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's a little different approach. And in the when you actually when you play tennis, is your manager goes to companies, and normally the companies want want to make commercial with you. So it's a little different um, mindset or mentality. And now when you when you're in business, you have to make it work. And that was not an easy transition, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But uh, but uh, I think that's also part of the part of the learning process and, and part of getting into the business world after playing tennis. But what really helped me is that while you're playing tennis, you lose a lot. And next day you have to get up and practice to improve to get better. And it's the same in the business world. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. That's a, it's a great learning. And so, I mean, just to get into this, so you you partnered up with Ion Tiriak, which again is well known for uh, Boris Beck being the manager of Boris Becker for many years. Um, and if I if I get this right, is you guys uh, took over the the Dusseldorf uh, tournament uh, or one of the slots uh, at that time, which is just before the Paris the French Open. Um, and now you, you, I believe you moved the tournament to Genf and you've been how long you've been running this? And and uh, of course, we'll talk about uh, what is actually happening right now. Yeah, um, actually, when when I stopped playing tennis beginning of 2012, I, I thought, okay, now I played so long tennis, and as a tennis player, you you really you on tour um, from January till till um, beginning of November. Then you have right. two three weeks vacation, then you do your preseason, then you start again in January end of December in Australia or in in Doha uh, where the season starts. So. It's uh, I would say average with Davis Cup with uh, uh, practice everything. I, I was maybe 40 weeks a year on the road, you know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I said after after I stopped, I said now for half a year or nine months I do nothing. Mm -hmm. I see my friends. I travel where I want to travel. I stay home if I want to stay home, but no obligations, um, just for me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this this really didn't happen because after four weeks um, th there was an opportunity to um, to buy the the sanction of the um, of the tournament ATP tournament in Düsseldorf, the World Team Cup, and I was mm -hmm. ambassador of the of the World Team Cup um, right. for for ten years as a German. Yeah. So. And uh, I heard about it, and, and then I said, wow, this would be great. And I said, but that's too early. So I spoke to, to Dirk, my, my coach and manager, and he said, you know, the last license which was sold in Germany was probably 15 years ago. So either you do it now or you do it in 15 years. So it's not right. so easy to buy a license because, yeah. because there is limited number. There are just 64 tournaments in the world, ADP tournaments, so, and all over the world. So, And uh, I wanted to have one in Germany, of course, would be great for me. And then... We are sitting together, and then we are thinking, like, who is who you think you can learn the most from? And my idol uh, was always Ion Tiriak. You mm -hmm. know, he was uh, known as an incredible manager, successful business person, and all the tournaments he organized are exceptional tournaments. Like the right. standard, the quality is so high. And then um, I, I knew at this time also his his right hand Gerard Subbanian, which actually now I'm doing the tournament. I did the tournament in Düsseldorf and also in, in Geneva now with. Mm -hmm. And I, I called him and said, Hey, do you think this would be an option? I would like to meet Jon and to talk to him. I have a I have the, the an option to buy this license, but I want to do it together with you guys. And is there a chance? And he's like, Hey, let's have dinner. So the mm -hmm. next possibility when uh, Jon was available, we we flew to Madrid, where he now has a Masters event in Madrid. He owns this tournament as well. Right, and okay. then we we're sitting down. And after and after dinner, he said, "Okay, let's do it together." So we 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 bought the the sanction together, had it uh, two or three years in Düsseldorf, then realized mm, the World Team Cup doesn't work so well anymore because in the the ten years before, everybody from Lendl, Agassi, Sampras, Becker, yes. every top guy was playing, but with Roger and Rafa, it came a little different strategy of scheduling, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to play a tournament before the Grand Slam, so mm -hmm. they went earlier to the Grand Slam. Said, okay, we have anyways a lot of matches, and we prefer to be to be a few days there, get used to the balls, to the uh, to the climate and everything. Mm -hmm. 
and practice on the courts. So the scheduling changed a little bit, and that's when we realized, hey, we need to change something, and then we moved the, the tournament uh, six years ago uh, to, to Geneva, and we right. still have it in Geneva. Yeah, uh, very interesting. And, and I do recall this tournament very well. Obviously, I grew up in Cologne, so it was just, you know, uh, an hour drive away, and I, I went to it many times. Obviously, this was before you took it over. Um, now, let's talk a bit about uh, the tournament. It was supposed to be a week ago, I believe, you mentioned earlier. And, uh, and yes. obviously it didn't happen because, uh, you know, tennis, as much as the rest of t sports, is shut down. Um, how did you guys deal with that um, bit of learnings, you know, for everyone who has owns tournaments or, or, or has the same predicament right now? Um, please share a bit of that. Yeah, of course, it was, was a really tough call for us. Um, I mean, it, it would have been <laughs> last week, actually. And um, then when everything happened in March, it was clear that the government and the ADP that they don't allow because of the COVID-19 virus, that they don't allow any events. And um, yeah, we had to react fast. I mean, we, we had to call all sponsors. We had to call all providers. Um, I mean, there and this as a player as a former player you don't really see but as mm. when you then have to organize an event you see how many small things from every flower ashtray uh, fence uh, whatever you you can think about um you have to you have to put on site basically because you you get the the club naked and you put everything there and you leave it naked again basically yeah, so and and so you you call all providers you call all sponsors, all Loge clients, uh, and say, hey, guys, we're really sorry, but uh, it will not happen this year. And, and then you start dealing with, with like the mess which is coming. Yeah, some people, sure. some people are upset. Some people, when you provide us, they say, ah, but you, you pay like away, there's a cancellation right? fee. Yeah. Exactly. But it's, it's a force majeure. So you have to negotiate and you have to deal with them. And luckily, I have to admit, everybody was very supportive because, mm. and, and that's what, what I felt. Um, I felt now in this crisis because everybody in a way is, is um, involved and everybody has some problems in this situation. So, and it actually, it was a very fair from all sides, a very fair discussions. And um, yeah, it was nice to see, you know, mm. everybody was loyal to the tournament. We were loyal to the provider. So in a way, it also brings you closer together because for the next years, you want to work together, you know, Definitely. and um, so, of course, it was a very hard, uh, hard thing for us in the beginning. But um yeah, and, I, and I the think plan is now: it, it, Are you planning to to play it later in the year, or it is completely scrapped for the year, and you're already working on 221 now? We are discussing. We are discussing to maybe have the event in September. Um, of course, this depends if I mean if it's financially possible to have it. You know, we we are now um, starting to talk to to some sponsors. Mm -hmm. and to the city and to the club is a, is a club available at this time uh, what is the city, city thinking about the government um, mm -hmm. because yeah it's risky i mean it's um, it's risky you you set everything up and then there comes another wave or you have uh, maybe people get infected on site you have to shut everything down right. so it's a little in a way, we want to do it to to you know also for the tennis players. I mean, right now when you see the players, they don't earn anything. It's not like in in in, in football that you have a contract and the club pays right. you. I mean, you're your own, um, yeah, yeah, you have your own company basically. Correct. But if you don't play tournaments, you don't earn anything. And yeah. so some players, lower ranked players, they're already struggling. So also for them, of course, to support him to make it work again. We would like to have it. We are not sure. We are we are still discussing. And right now, I would say it's 50-50 mm. because the, the tour will open up slowly again. Most likely, it will be without or Right now, it will be without yeah. spectators. Uh, maybe we have later on in the year limited number of spectators. So right. ATP right now is working on the... Yeah, on, on the guidelines, what right now uh, can be done. And we also have to then see if it's if it's possible it's to make it for viable. us or not. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and I'd love to go there for a minute here. Um, what do you see or, or what have you seen already from the ATP Tour um, and or, you know, the big boys like the U.S. Open Tennis, which uh, which is obviously the one also sort of the next big one, I guess, coming up um, 
since the others are all been canceled. Uh, what do you see where you can learn from for your own tournament or, or just in general you can share with, with the tennis fans out here? Yeah, I mean, what, what, I, what I hear is that I, I think the, the US Open made it clear after the French Open um, without anybody knowing announced that they're going to play in September. The US Open also said that they want to try um, to play, you know, they in, in the worst case without spectators. But a few weeks ago, it, it didn't really look like because if you go as an athlete or if you go to the States, if you're allowed to get in, you have to be mm. four weeks in quarantine. But I think now they found a way around it or it's less than this. So and it's still it's June. So till uh, middle of August, you have some more time. You see how the Yes. Yeah, how the the how it, the world changes with, with yes. the virus, and um, so what I heard now that they are trying to play, but right now without spectators. Then there will be French Open will be end of September, and then that some tournaments will they will try to play before. Also Geneva could, would be a possible possible scenario to play to be played in September and then I guess the the Asian tour and the indoor tournaments in Europe like later in the year but the, that's the plan right now if everything goes as positive as it looks like but you never know if a second wave happens and who can fly so that's also the tricky part with yes. with tennis is because it's so international and there are players from all over the world and right. then it's a question is it fair if if you say ah people from south america are not to fly is it fair to give points to the rest of the players and mm -hmm. If someone else can or not, show up know, because he's exactly. not allowed to, yeah, no, that, I think exactly. I, I totally agree. It's, it's you know, tennis. A there's a few, situation. yeah, there's a few sports like that where you clearly have a, a, a global, uh, a global, like a, not just uh, yeah, you have players from all over the world, like you said, and uh, and that becomes very hard if if some of them cannot travel because of the restrictions uh, from the country maybe they're from or the countries that they were stuck. Uh, yeah, that's that's def definitely difficult uh, discussions going on there. I'm sure for the tour on one side you want to open up because at least you want to restart things and and uh, as you said the livelihood of these players are are at line as well, right? Not everyone has big endorsement deals and 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 plenty of money already in the pocket, right? There's plenty of guys who uh, who need yes. this tournament, so yeah, it's a it's a difficult one. And what's happening now is um, you see it in Germany. I mean, uh, the German Federation was one of the first countries, actually, together with Austria, who made their own um, their own national league, basically. So they will start now. Um, they will start now for I think it's six weeks or five weeks with okay. 32 German players, uh, male players, and 24 female players to have their own tour in Germany um, mm -hmm. to stream it, you know, also for the players first to have some income to yeah. be able to survive uh, because you don't know, is it six months, three months, nine months, one year, who knows, Correct. but to be able to to generate some income and also to be able once uh, the, the professional tour starts again to have some matches, to have at least something similar than professional matches. I mean, you don't have ball boys, you don't have linesmen, but uh, at least you have you compete in a way. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it's a great thing. And, and now um, Janko Tepsarovic, for example, he's doing the same in Serbia. Right. And uh, there are a lot of great players uh, like uh, Lajovic, uh, Krajinovic, uh, Jere. Then coming also what I heard is Kashanov, Rublev, you know, also from other countries. Because everybody right now is just waiting. Hey, where can I play yeah. matches? Where can yeah. I, yeah, yeah. you know, get back in the competition mode again when everything starts? Yeah, so definitely. I mean, Germany always had a good, um, you know, it's the Bundesliga, I think it's even called, right? Um, which is, is, is that what they're re restarting or is, is it a complete? new competition no it's a new competition i mean these are really the 32 best players like i, I think uh, alex verov is not playing but then struff is playing kohlschreiber i think is playing so really they try to the professional players they try to play in groups against each other six weeks in a row or five weeks in a row and um, to have matches you know to be right. able to okay. make money to and to have matches it's different than the bundesliga club matches because 
there was everybody playing. I mean, there you had, uh, I don't know, Spanish, Italian, Germans, French, right, everybody yeah, in one team. Correct. And this is, is difficult now. Right. So this is just for the German players to get them back into action, basically, right? Okay. I yeah. like that. I think that that's a really good way to look at it. Uh, Very, I mean, one thing yes. of, you know, we did a lot of work with the U.S. Open over the uh, over the many, many years. We were their agent here in Asia for uh, their media rights, so been there many times. And if I remember the number correctly, I think they bring something around the neighborhood of 700 to 800,000 fans through the gate. Uh, during these two weeks of the tournament, uh, it's in the. I think it's not far off from what I what I recall, which is obviously an unbelievable yes. amount of people and an unbelievable amount of money which comes with that, right? And if you can imagine now doing this without the fans uh, and, and the loss, of course, uh, of there is it's just insane. Uh, and how how important is is uh, the tickets receipt part for your tournament in, in Genf? Um, how balanced is that between sponsorship and, and other revenue streams? Yeah, for for us, just when you when you see gate purely is is maybe around fifteen percent, but of course then you have loge clients and you have privileged seats which uh, which are in the VIP area. Mm. Um, I think, but uh, of course, I mean, and that's that's a big difference com with the Grand Slam compared to if you compare to Grand Slam. Of course, my tournament is is very small. It's an ATP two fifty, but when you see the um, the media rights, the Grand Slam has like the, uh, generates with the media rights the, the amount of money i mean yes. if you lose this that's really a big thing and sponsorship you know there i i think of course gate is also big but uh, i'm sure you can you have also don't have to build up the infrastructure if you don't have spectators and these kind of things so i i'm sure that the grand slams that they really would like to to um, have an event because of the sponsorship and media rights uh, the money ge they generate from there yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, you fall, will follow this much closer than I do. Is there any word that any of the other Grand Slams are trying to maybe still host it, but just a later part of the year? Or for them, it's it's shut. That's it. I, I'm, I mean, I didn't hear anything about the Wimbledon because uh, because I think it's difficult. Also, it depends on the the later in the year the more rain you're probably gonna have yep. the more yeah, uh, weather gets in the way in london <laughs> yeah yeah the humidity you have and and if the the grass is just a little bit wet it's so slippery no chance to play yep. so i don't really see wimbledon um wimbledon playing also what wimbledon did uh, very smart when there was a sars virus i think it was in 2002 they made the insurance uh, against the yes, pandemic correct which nobody else has and and so yes. they they are covered for the financial loss which is great and very smart um i i, I didn't hear that any other tournament um made any insurance uh, like this that's right uh, so i don't see them really playing for different reasons um, australian mm. open i didn't hear anything but also I mean, Australia is coming up already in the, actually they played yeah. this year, you know, so, so it was the only Grand Slams which was played in January Correct. and, and, and it comes up in, in January. There's a question, how it does everything go forwards? That that's a big question if they actually manage to play in, in January or not. Correct. Yeah. Because the same problem, you know, having these players yeah. flying in from around the world and, you know, and I think that's the big challenge as well. You know, it's, it's really once countries are opening up their borders again and letting, you know, and the travel starts, I think we were talked about it earlier, um, whether it's now professional players who are on tour or of course your average fan uh, who travels around the world. Um, I think that's going to be interesting to see where this is all heading, but that's not really a, our topic here. So now before we, before <laughs> we wrap it up here, what, what I'd love to sort of, um, talk a bit about i know you're doing a few other things as well um you've been a you know you've been the uh, the team captain of the fed cup uh, the, the federation cups uh, for the for germany um you know you you do manage some players so you obviously keep yourself busy and very much involved you were the coach of uh, of angelica gerber of course for a while um you know how, so how do you spend your day i mean how does your you know how, what do you do as a retired uh, successfully retired pro tennis player you know how does your week and, and and year look like uh you know i have to admit that now during during the the lockdown i mean my life uh, i got uh, three months ago i i got a, a second a second uh, baby boy you know so is mm -hmm. um was for me actually was a good time to be home to to support yeah. my wife to uh, to so to be there for my my older son you know so to just have a family life because 
Um, otherwise, I'm traveling actually a lot. As, as you said, I'm, I'm um, now the Fed Cup captain, so that means I go to the Grand Slam, go to a lot of big tournaments. We had our first um, first match against Brazil in February, so my year this year before the lockdown was, okay, I was in Australia in, in January, went right. in February with the, with the German um, Fed Cup team to Brazil, and then was supposed to go to Miami. Then organ I have also in between to organize my own tournament, which... Uh, as we mentioned, got cancelled now. But so it, it's a pretty busy year normally, and um, and then it's normally you go to Grand Slam, so you're going to be in May in French Open. The week before, I have my tournament. Then you will be in in June, end of June, you will be in Wimbledon, and in between. I do my tournament. I do my private uh, private investments. I, of course, I, I also like to follow up. I, I we have an agency where we manage uh, manage players. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, yeah, it's kind of busy, but um, I like it. I mean, I, I was uh, my wife always says you're kind of workaholic and <laughs> you do too many things, and you should be more with the family. And I, I try to have my quiet time also, but I also like to to be involved in a lot of things because now I I'm still relatively young. I I still have energy energy to do these things, and I I think when you get a little bit older, maybe you feel that you want to be more home and but right now tennis is still my life and my passion and um yeah i, I want to do a lot of things in tennis uh, and that comes through and and obviously we met there i think it was february in, in zurich uh, with a couple other guys uh, and uh, i think you were uh, you had just come back from australia and we we're heading out to brazil again so you know and i don't think you would do that if you didn't have that passion and the and and, and to clearly the uh, the yeah, the excitement which you still get from it i think being around it i can see that and and that's amazing so uh Raina, this was fun I, I really enjoyed it um thank you for sharing your stories uh as i of course congratulations again on your baby boy there um you know you've had an amazing career and uh and you've obviously still very deeply involved in the world of tennis um and i'm certain when you go to these big tournaments around the world there's always new business opportunities coming up so uh, i think the networking i'm sure you have in that is amazing and and that's i'm sure where we'll keep seeing more and interesting things coming from you thank you marcus it was a lot of fun and uh, i hope that when when the, everything gets a little bit back to normal again that we meet in person again soon definitely yeah, i look forward to, and we got to hit some balls one day here <laughs> yes we should we have to <laughs> <laughs> thanks reiner you have a good day there thanks, in germany Marcus. cheers bye 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 the sports entrepreneurs by marcus lure podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Lure. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.